We start, we'll be starting in just a moment. We, uh, we're gonna push the coffee break back to after the second session since uh, that's, you just had lunch. Um, however, one of our two session speakers seems to have stepped out for the moment, so I've sent someone to fetch him, so we'll wait a moment. Um, look, just to fill time, but make the point, uh, Jose and others and Willem have, have already engaged in the discussion. The, the, the fundamental question right now for many of us is, A, is the emerging market slowdown a fundamental structural thing or a cyclical thing? B, assuming it's in some cases one, in some cases the other, how do we differentiate? And uh, a lot of that is done at the country by country level, both in this building here at the Peterson Institute and of course in much greater detail by Moody's. But there are sort of some conceptual large scale themes we'd like to bring out. And for that we have Arvind Subramanian from the Pierce Institute and Lucio Vinas de Souza from Moody's. And I'm afraid I may be forced to take a coffee break if I don't see people appear in the next minute or two. Um, I apologize to everyone for this when we have had the scheduling move. Maybe, maybe Lucio can come up and start his presentation. Adam, thanks so much for that. Okay. Now, I will try again. Okay, so there we go. Now, uh, I don't have to spend time with the uh, legal disclaimers because I dealt with during the previous session. Uh, I would like to start by uh, embasing the presentation that I'm going to be doing uh, to you. Now, the logic of the exercise that I'm going to be showing to you is the following. Uh, we have this uh, observable uh, reduction of growth in emerging markets, and it is an important analytical consideration for us to understand what is the cyclical and what's the structural component of it. Uh, there were several estimations that were done in the recent past, notably one from the IMF uh, during the course of last year. We felt necessary to uh, sharpen our understanding of the processes, and that is what lies behind uh, what I'm going to be showing to you uh, during the course of the next 15 minutes. So, you have on the uh, USBs that were distributed uh, to you at the entrance, uh, among of the works that you have included there, that is our Global Sovereign Outlook, which we put out in uh, November of the last year. Now, the way that we tried to approach the uh, content of that publication was to look at the main potential drivers for stresses on sovereign credit worthness during the course of the following year, namely for 2014. We zoomed in into uh, a series of uh, potential drivers, and one of those that we identified was exactly this ongoing growth slowdown that we have uh, among notably major emerging countries. Uh, we uh, identified it as being, as being composed of both cyclical and structural, uh, structural elements, and we associated to it some of the ongoing policy decisions that were being taken by the monetary authorities of uh, large developed economies, namely what we call tapering, quote unquote. We also uh, identified the fact that the is still existing growth gap between emerging and developed economies is, is still historically quite large. Take a look at what is a long-term estimation of this uh, growth gap between developed and developing countries, right? Uh, the peak of the gap was back in 2009 when developing countries uh, were growing at six percentage points per year faster than uh, mature uh, developed economies, really something extraordinarily large, the gap now is around 3%. But if you look at this in historical terms, this is still unusually large. 
Uh, if we do a uh, long-term estimation using data from the World Bank, my old house, the long-term average growth differential between emerging markets and advanced economies is just about half of that, so around 1.6, 1.7%. That means that even with the significant fall of the growth gap between those two halves of the global economy, emerging markets are still growing much, much faster than what is their historical average. Okay, uh, we attribute this uh, growth slowdown, as I indicated before, to a mix of what are cyclical and structural components. There are some uh, policy adjustments which lie behind the cyclical part of the adjustment. We have talked repeatedly about one of those uh, cyclical components. Namely, this is the adjustment to uh, the changing uh, policy mix in major developed economies, call it tapering, uh, if you will. Uh, but even the cyclical component actually has differentiated effects between different sets of emerging markets. Uh, because we just had a Latin American uh, discussion, I will frame the argumentation in terms of the Latin American universe. Think of those two countries, so uh, Brazil of life and America of life. This cyclical adjustment in the American uh, monetary uh, policy mix effectively uh, is happening because of the improved macroeconomic conditions in the United States itself which have a direct set of positive uh, side effects for Mexico, which are absent in the case of other uh, Latin American economies, which are not as integrated to the American economy as Mexico is, namely in the case of Brazil. The implication of that is that even looking at the uh, cyclical component of the shock, you are going to have different effects between different types of emerging markets, even if they are on the same region, because there are other compensating effects which are different between different countries. Okay, so uh, the other side of the coin, of course, is how significant is, co is the component of the uh, uh, structural slowdown. There are several different uh, reasons why countries may hit the sort of a structural speed limit. They go all the way from long-term demographic factors to uh, institutional shortcomings and infrastructure. Uh, again, because we just had a uh, Latin American discussion, I will give you an example of how this pan out for a country. I was with uh, Mauro on the meetings of the Inter-American Development Country in uh, Developed Development uh, Bank in Brazil, in a lovely region of northern Brazil. Unfortunately, to get there took us around 22 hours, right? Uh, when we went to China last year, it was faster. Right? One of the reasons for that is because the transportation infrastructure in the Federal Republic of Brazil has some components that, uh, let me put it this way, could be improved. Right? So that was a very graphic uh, demonstration to us of the effects of this uh, infrastructure constraint in terms of the growth potential of a country. Okay, so that is what we are going to be doing in terms of our exercise, which is fundamentally a very intuitive uh, set of analytical estimations to try to bring concrete figures to a discussion which uh, can be rather woolly sometimes. The slowdown, structural, cyclical. We are trying to put hard figures behind the concepts. We do that to a large subset of emerging economies, namely all the G20 emerging economies, which are together responsible for over two-thirds of the whole emerging markets GDP universe. How do we do that? Uh, being uh, responsible professionals, what we try to do is to use different types of uh, estimation techniques to have a set of uh, comparators that would enable us to look if the uh, estimations themselves are adequately robust. We do that with uh, two sets of uh, uh, analytical methods, uh, a traditional statistical method, namely a Hendrick Prescott filter, and uh, what is a more theoretically grounded uh, uh, analytical instrument, namely a production function approach. Uh, just to give you a little more analytical background on what those two things are, the first statistical method is merely a smoothing method for a long-term time series. Think of this as a glorified average, in practical terms, of a data series. When you take everything apart, that's what a Hendrick Prescott filter is. You have a long-term time series, you deal with that in terms of uh, smoothing parameters. 
which has obviously the advantage that uh, is very data parsimonious. I only need one data series, but has the disadvantage that uh, is theoretically non-based, right? You are just extracting uh, a piece of data via a statistical trick. Also has one small analytical problem on the sense that the extremes of the distribution, when you do the statistical process, they are uncertain. There are ways in which you can deal with that. You can extend your data series with, for instance, forecasts, therefore looping up the uh, part of the series which became uncertain because of the distribution of the filter. The second part, which is uh, much more data demanding, is based on the notion that we produce stuff in economies using production factors. I am a production factor. I am labor, right? The table or the computer over there, they are a production factor. They are capital, right? So what we try to do here is to build series of those production factors, labor, capital, or more precisely, changes thereof, and we put everything else in a residual, and we call this residual total factor productivity. How effective we are in terms of uh, working uh, this combination of labor and capital. Practical example, again using the uh, example of working uh, in Brazil. Uh, if you are working in an environment in which uh, is 40 degrees out there, and you have condition there, you can combine this labor and capital much more effective if you are locked in a building without a elevator, it has 30 floors, and there is no conditioner there. Believe you me, it's much more difficult to work effectively under those conditions. Think of this as technology, right? Technology in the production function is effectively estimated as a residual from the regression because you don't actually have time series that show to you what is technology. So we do those two things. We don't have any a priori in terms of what's the component of cyclical and what's the component of structural in terms of the deceleration. Now, before I actually show to you the uh, results of the estimation, uh, one thing that we should uh, realize is that, albeit the overall deceleration is around 3% between 2010 and 2013, for the larger sample of systemically important emerging markets, the G20s, is actually higher than this. It's around 3.4%. And on this universe, you have several systemically important emerging markets whose growth deceleration is 5% or above. Take a look at the set there. Countries in Latin America, countries in, sub, uh, uh, in the uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, India itself, Turkey, so you have systemically important emerging markets of deceleration really is quite considerable in this time frame. OK, so what do we get? First, allow me to show to you the uh, individual results of the two approaches, two and a half, because I'm going to show you something else. And then I am going to translate all the figures that I'm showing to you later. So that's what we get out of the production function. That is what we get out of the uh, uh, Hendrik Prescott filter applied to a GDP series. And we do a Hendrik Prescott filter also on an industrial production series, simply because of timeliness reasons. GDP would simply deliver you the status of the economy last year. Production, uh, uh, industrial production series, they are monthly series, right? So they would be able to give to us at least a taste of what is the level of the deceleration right now, because we have available uh, industrial production series effectively until last month, right? So they show to us the degree of the deceleration up to the first quarter of this year. We do this with uh, annualized uh, industrial production series. Of course, the results are significantly uh, more varied when we use the industrial production series because of the different shares of industrial production between different GDPs and the very variability that an IPI has in relation to the GDP itself. So think of this as an additional uh, robustness metric that we use. So bottom line, what do we get? We get this. To no one's surprise, our estimations show that there are both structural and cyclical components on the deceleration. We knew that already, right? But the interesting thing is that uh, when we look at the individual results of the methods, the bulk of the deceleration actually happens to be cyclical for most of the countries. 
we actually had uh, some statements on the previous Latin American session that are consistent with that. Remember what José de Gregorio said to us, right? Deceleration is cyclical. The results that we have from an analytical point of view support the notion that the bulk of the deceleration is cyclical. A smaller component is structural. The results varied between uh, different uh, estimation uh, methodologies, but actually using GDP data from production function and from the H, uh, HP filter, results are actually rather similar between 20% and less than a third actually is structural. The whole rest between 80% and 70% is cyclical. We have uh, larger shares of structural on the IPI based one, but part of this comes from the very nature of what is an industrial production index, so it's much more variable. However, there are individual countries in which the structural component of the deceleration is much more significant. And in some cases, actually, is the largest one. Notably, that's the case for China and for Russia. In some of the estimations, actually, in the Russian Federation, the structural component of the deceleration <laughs> actually is the most important of all. all right? So but the overall picture around uh, the emerging markets that we have here the G20 emerging markets is that the bulk of the deceleration is cyclical, not structural. Okay, so here I am putting uh, figures in terms of what I just told you verbally. You don't have to try to read the table uh, here. You have it uh, printed on the booklet that you have uh, in front of you. And here you also have the same information at a country-specific basis. The figures that I was quoting to you are from uh, the simple average for the G20 emerging countries and also of the GDP-weighted ones. The GDP-weighted ones are actually surprisingly similar between the uh, production function and HP approaches, so around one quarter of the total is, uh, is, uh, is uh, structural. The bulk, therefore, around three quarters is merely cyclical. Right? So, bottom line of this uh, presentation that I gave to you, and I once again banished my reputation for sticking on time by being uh, 15 minutes to the dot. <laughs> now, the growth deceleration among emerging markets is real and is very significant, right? Uh, however, there are some emerging markets, the Indonesias of life, the Mexicos of life, as a matter of fact, in which you don't really observe a deceleration because of structural reforms in some of those cases. But the generalized story is there is a deceleration and is significant. However, the book of the deceleration, again, for the average of the emerging countries, is not structural in nature. It is cyclical. There are specific cases in which a significant share, in one particular case, the book of it, are structural, but that's not really the overall story for emerging markets. It's mostly cyclical. Okay, and with that, I uh, will let the floor to Arvind. Thank you very much, Lucio. Um, <laughs> if I can just editorialize for a second while Arvind pulls up his genuinely freshly made PowerPoint, um, that that's the kind of exercise that once somebody does it, you say, oh, why didn't we all think of that? And it's terrific that Moody's put its resources into doing that. It's also terrific that you have the two methods robustly giving you roughly the same results. I think that's a very exciting way to, to think about this issue. Now, I, we've asked Arvind to speak on this issue because, as some of you may recall, I mean, he's our big thinker about long-term growth, especially in the emerging markets, and a few months ago made a, perhaps now even more controversial than then, claim that the, you shouldn't be fooled by what's going on in the BRICS uh, that the slow, there were reasons not to fear the slowdown, and Arvin's going to update us now, which may nicely dovetail with Lucio. Yeah, um, uh, thanks very much, Adam uh, and Lucio. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> great to be here. Uh, I'm calling this a, a tropical temperate view. Tropical because you know I'm from the tropics, so sun. I believe in sunshine, a and temperate because you know. Uh, less vulnerable to the vicissitudes of the cycle, you know. I, I don't understand the cycle. The cycle is just, uh, it's too high-powered, and, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm mostly a kind of medium-term, simple kind of guy. Um, and so, so I, I want to look at uh, 
two issues. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to focus on two questions. Is the rising rest weakening West story over or significantly changed? Uh, and um, something that Adam suggested that I look at, you know, in terms of looking at the world, you know, big picture, is trade ceasing to be an engine of growth? Because uh, there was a controversy sparked by Gavin Davis uh, a few months uh, ago, uh, and then Paul Krugman and uh, everyone weighed in on it. So, and I've done some work recently on this with Martin Kessler uh, at the Institute, so I thought I'd weigh in a little bit on this as well. So uh, I want to show you something. Uh, uh, it's a kind of variation of what uh, Lucio you showed, but f much more from a kind of growth perspective. It is the rising rest story over? A and uh, I would argue that you know, uh, oh, this is you know we need to uh, look seriously uh, at this and be skeptical about this, uh, because essentially uh, so to echo something that Lucio said, we've really had a, a phenomenal uh, uh, development over the last 15 years, which I call convergence with a vengeance. Uh, this is a, a, a growth perspective story. You know, if you look at uh, the long term, very, very long term, or just the post-war period, the number of countries that were growing faster than the United States in per capita terms, that's important. That's a convergence story. Uh, that's what shows how, you ca how fast you're catching up with the frontier. And the pace at which they were catching up. In the post-war period, less than a third of countries were catching up, and those that were catching up were catching up at... Uh, something like you know, 1.5% a year. But something happened in the, in the mid to late 1990s, and the whole thing changed. Uh, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of countries that were growing faster than the US, i.e. catching up almost 90% of the world, and at twice the pace uh, seen even in the post-war period. So this is what I call the broadening and acceleration of convergence, which I call convergence with a vengeance. The interesting thing is that even if you take the WIO projections going forward, you know, the number of countries converging unchanged, slight deceleration in the pace of convergence. So, and, and you know, uh, one can have doubts about uh, the IMF estimates going forward, but broadly, the convergence with a vengeance story is not over. It's here in spades, uh, even going forward. And of course, one of the reasons it's happened after the mid-90s, I would argue, is that you know something fundamental changed uh, around the world. At least one can make the claim that most countries stopped doing the most egregiously stupid things, and that's here to, here to stay. Now, how does this fit in with this structural cyclical story? And, and you know, um, the two aspects of the cycle, of course, were commodity prices and liquidity, and we know that in the medium term, growth and the terms of trade are very weakly correlated. Moreover, half the world, developing world, is a net commodity importer, half is a net commodity exporter. So it can't drive world growth. Uh, it, it has to be, at best, a wash or, on average. So, so in, in the medium term, this can't be an important factor. You know, this is kind of goes up and down. The other story is, is the easy liquidity story. Um, we know, for example, that, you know, Capital flows and crises are positively correlated. You know, this is the sudden stop phenomenon. You get more, it, it goes back, and growth suffers. And it's because of what happens in the bust that in the medium term, again, capital flows are uncorrelated with growth. Uh, this is based on work I've done with Raghu, the academic, not Raghu, the current policymaker. <laughs> it's based on work I've done with Danny Roderick. It's based on work I've done with Olivier Jeanne and John Williamson uh, here at the Institute. In the medium term, capital flows are uncorrelated with growth. So this is, is it, from a medium term point of view, easy liquidity is, is, is not an important story. It's, it's mostly irrelevant. You know, in the short term, it goes up and down. Uh, so, so, so this can't play uh, an important story. Moreover, I would argue, based this, this is for a chart from my book, if you look at the timing of the improvement, this convergence with the vengeance story, it predates you know, the commodity price easy uh, liquidity story. It starts, in fact, this is a chart showing how many countries started converging with the United States. It starts actually in the early 90s, and the same chart, I mean, the same pattern holds if you look at also at the magnitude of convergence. So convergence with a vengeance um, is here to stay. Its medium term growth is not based on uh, you know, the cycle, cyclical factors by definition uh, because capital flows and commodity prices are uncorrelated. And if you look at the timing as well, this is uh, 
you know, the str uh, str a different way. I, I would phrase this in a different way. I, I would say, for example, in the short run, we're all coupled. In the medium term, we're all uncoupled. Uh, I, I think that's kind of the, the, the takeaway from, from this uh, angle. The second thing, uh, the second uh, topic I said I would speak about is, is, um, is trade. Now, this is from a paper which uh, Paul Krugman has been uh, very generous in, in quoting and citing, which is that, you know, if you look at world trade to GDP, there are four phases. You know, the, the first phase of globalization, 1870-1914, the deglobalization phase when, uh, in Keynes's evocative term, when the, you know, the, the serpents of militarism and thing, you know, in, uh, whatever, infested this paradise pre-1970, and then we have the re-globalization after World War II. And then what I call the fourth phase, hyper-globalization. A uh, trade to GDP starts rising uh, along with, so, so the rise in trade to GDP coincides with convergence with a vengeance, broadly speaking. And that's not uh, an accidental correlation because now if you extend this chart, this chart ends in 2011. I've just had, Martin has just given me the 2012 chart, which is what has provoked all this angst. There is, in fact, a slight decline in world trade to GDP ratios. So the question is, oh my god, trade to GDP is declining. Is the trade impulse kind of fading uh, 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 for the world? Two things to remember is that trade to GDP, remember, trade reflects in part GDP growth. So the fact that trade to GDP is declining is because GDP is, is growing slower. So, so it's not a negative impulse from trade to GDP, but a negative impulse from GDP to trade. Point number one. Point number two, uh, it also you need to remember that at the global level, trade to GDP also dis depends upon the distribution of output. The more output becomes democratized, uh, i.e. convergence, the faster the trade to GDP rises, because it's as if in a world where gravity determines trade, it's as if we have more countries in the world and smaller countries, and we know smaller countries trade more than larger countries. So these are both impulses going from GDP and its distribution to trade, and not a negative story, a negative drag from trade to GDP. That's point number one. Point number two, which is, I think, the most unnoticed and the most, I would say, uh, amazing fact about trade in the last 10 to 15 years, is what I call the protectionist dog that did not bite or even bark. Now, many observers noted after the global crisis that there was very little protectionism. So uh, some people have attributed it to global value-added chains, like Richard Baldwin. Others, like Barry Eichengreen and Danny, have said it's because, unlike in the Great uh, uh, Depression, we didn't have the golden straitjacket. We had monetary and, uh, and fiscal policies levers to use, so we didn't resort to protectionism. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a much bigger trade shock in American and indeed all uh, Western economies. China represents the biggest structural trade shock that have ever hit the US. This is a chart showing imports all done in value-added terms uh, relative to domestic absorption in the US. And you see that China is just off the charts. And yet, in response to this China trade shock, there was very little protectionist response in the US. And this, despite the fact one, it was much bigger than the Japan shock or the Mexico shock. Two, it, despite the fact that the intellectual climate change in this country has been shifting gradually but perceptibly towards protectionism. Uh, I, I don't uh, uh, sh uh, say this, I mean, I've not shown this, but if I asked you what's common to Larry Summers, Paul Samuelson, Paul Stiglitz, uh, Joe Stiglitz, uh, Michael Spence, and Alan Blinder, what is common to all of them? you know, Nobel Prize, uh, the, the John Bates, Clark, et cetera, et cetera. What is common is that these five heavyweight intellectuals, not isolationists, fairly liberal, fairly cosmopolitan, have all expressed misgivings about globalization in the last five years. So despite the intellectual climate change, despite the strong economic headwinds in the US, in fact, what is remarkable based on some recent work by David Otter and Gordon Hansen, this China shock has led to labor displacement in the US that is, I mean, huge. 
in terms of employment, wages, job losses, fiscal benefits, it's reduced, and yet we didn't see the uh, protectionist response. So I interpret this as a basis to be cautiously optimistic about protectionism going forward. So don't infer negative from trade to GDP. Be cautiously optimistic that despite all these headwinds, no protectionist response, uh, and these are all kind of non-negatives. But the final positive I would sub submit to you is in fact, the, the liberalization, uh, policy liberalization machine is relatively active. I call this you know, promiscuous regionalism, everyone getting into bed with everyone else on, on regional trade agreements. And, and this is a chart which shows who is getting into bed with whom, all the major countries with each other. And you see that the, 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 the red nose are very few, and they're being progressively swallowed by uh, the free trade agreements that others are negotiating amongst themselves. And you know, slowly the competitive liberalization dynamic uh, will probably also swallow up the reds as well. So in terms of policy liberalization as well, you know, the, the, the trade uh, channel is, is at work. Now, uh, as I said, I, I want to end uh, with a few, uh, you know, concluding thoughts. In the short run, yes, growth slower than many expected a year ago. In fact, if you look at the, the WIO forecast between October of last year and April of this year, in terms of emerging markets, it's not uh, too much of a change, very small change. The big uh, revision downward has, is relative to April of last year before the taper began. But I would argue that even in the short run, actually the outlook has improved in many countries, India, Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, well, maybe not Thailand, uh, partly because you know we've had the adjustment with the big exchange rate shocks and some policy adjustments. So these, these countries are better off. And because the political outlook is changing uh, in some of these countries, uh, especially my own. So uh, there's a Modi, uh, anticipatory Modi wave in India. I mean, uh, I, I think foreign investors are so gullible, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, in advance of us being sure what's going to happen. But, you know, let's ride this. You know, uh, I can say that think the political outlook is improving in many, many of these countries. And as I showed earlier, that in the medium term, the convergence dynamic is at play, at play uh, because the fundamentals are, are different now. Uh, and, and maybe the pace will slow down, but, but this fundamental phenomenon of you know, uh, emerging market countries, developing countries growing faster is likely to continue. And a last point on China. China is sui generis, and, and you know, Nick spoke about it yesterday. But I will insist that this Chinese slowdown uh, as something that we all talk about and, and obsess about, is not a fault of China's. It's a fault of all you guys who thought that 10.5% would continue forever. Or as I say, the puzzle about China is not why it's slowing down now, but why it didn't slow down earlier. 10.5% uh, growth for 30 years was, in fact, the aberration. And the fact that it's slowing down to something like Seven, seven and a half is what you should always have expected, consistent with you know the basic convergence dynamic at play. Uh, and finally, can trade continue without an engine of growth? I think it can, but of course, U.S. Congress, where art thou? You know, uh, 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 it's a, it's going to be a key. You know, the, the U.S. Congress has to you know keep the the trade liberalization momentum going, and if it does. Uh, you know, the, 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 the things that I told you about, the competitive dynamic. Because remember, uh, one of the amazing things is that uh, in, in all of this, uh, China, which I had about a year ago feared, would uh, view TPP and TTIP as a kind of challenge and a threat, is now going over backwards, partly because of domestic, uh, what's happening domestically, the imperatives for reform are increasing internally. But China is now not only playing ball you know, in the International Services Agreement, not only playing ball in the International Technology Agreement, not only playing ball on environmental agreements, it is publicly saying that it wants to join TPP. And the irony is that it's the US that wants to keep it away more than China wants to join today. So, so as long as Congress can get its act together, this trade as an engine of growth, that dynamic can continue, and we shall see the glass, you know, rising, the water in the glass rising. Thank you. I am delighted that we've had the usual verve from Arvind, and he amazingly put some things together very quickly based on a recent conversation. Um, but more importantly, uh, 
we've had two completely different approaches to get us to a pretty similar point, even down to China, where Arvind says it's a converge, long-term convergence issue, and Lucio says it looks like there's a big structural component to the slowdown, which in both cases is, which is different ways of saying much the same thing. So this is kind of exciting. We now have the answer. Would anybody like to ask any questions to those who have the answer? Yes. Uh, wait for the microphone, Willem, and then the gentleman in back. Actually, could I ask you to go to the standing mic? Thank you. I would like to take issue just factually with the picture painted about a, uh, the last speaker about the lack of protectionism. Uh, protectionism is, is rampant, uh, just taking uh, uh, harder to monitor forms these days. The conventional um, no, quotas, tariffs, even anti-dumping duties, which are easily monitorable and uh, subject to uh, the opprobrium of the WTO, are now account for less than half of all the protectionist measures. I recognize a perusal of Simon Evanett's Global Trade Alert uh, for this. Um, and uh, uh, just in the, uh, I just looked it up again, uh, June 2012, May 2013, there were 431 new protectionist measures, 141 commerce liberalizing measures. The G8 accounted for 30% of the protectionist measures. The G20, 65%. And China was the most frequently harmed by these measures. As I said, traditional forms of protectionism, less than 30%, ones that go under the scope of the familiar rider. And I'm talking about here phytosanitary excuses for trade, right? environmental fig leaves for trade protectionism, um, uh, and then uh, variants of anti-dumping or... Uh, uh, you no know, uh, import subsidization things, they're, they're rampant. And uh, I think they account undoubtedly for part of the deceleration in, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, well, the stabilization of the, of the trade to GDP ratio. Thank you. Uh, before Arvind says anything, and I do want him to say anything, I will point out that, leaving aside even at scores, um, Gary Hofbauer, Jeff Schott, Kathleen Semino in this institute did a very good study a few months ago on the huge proliferation of local content requirements around the world in the US, China, Brazil, elsewhere, that I also commend you as a different form of uh, protectionism being tracked. But Arvind, you know these things. What do you want? Uh, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I've read the, uh, the Simon Evans uh, Global Trade Report. Um, uh, and my response to this is very simple. Numbers and magnitudes are very different. These are count measures. Sure. Uh, these are count measures. So one, uh, we don't know what the tariff equivalent is. One, two, we don't know what the coverage is on, on terms of in terms of the base cover. And, and uh, I would hazard a, a very uh, uh, strong wager that it covers a very small per percentage uh, when you multiply the the, the, the magnitudes times the quantities a very small fraction of trade. Uh, that's why, by definition, they are you know, non-tariff measures. If people really wanted to do across-the-board protectionist measures, they would. So, so my thing is that, yes, there. But, but relative to the trade shock, remember, Willem, we had the biggest trade shock, much bigger, one, in a cyclical sense, in the Great Depression. Two, the structural trade shock in the US is far greater than anything we witnessed. So relative to that, this is peanuts. We should be, we should be uh, I mean, we should, we should uh, uh, be grateful that, you know, it was so small uh, relative to the magnitude of the shock. And so I think in, in quantitative terms and relative to the shock, this is probably very small. So the gentleman at the back mic, if you could identify yourself, please. Yeah, Manmohan Kumar from the IMF. Uh, very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think this issue of structural versus cyclical, clearly tide is turning now and there's <laughs> your uh, analysis uh, proves it that you know, a lot of it was cyclical six months ago, nine months ago, it was thought to be mostly structural. My point actually concerns a country which you say is structural uh, decline, uh, 
but it has enormous implications for the rest of the world, which is China. Now, Arvind said very rightly that you can't expect a con economy to grow at 10.5% forever, for sure. But when you have that economy growing at 10.5% for many years, and it's the second largest economy in the world, what are the implications of that for the emerging markets? And this is an, in an environment where you have the euro area you know, flirting with deflation, activity likely to be very weak, abenomics means you know, perhaps you will have success in Japan, maybe not. So the external environment generally is going to be weak and you have China, which is, uh, happens to be the largest trading partner for many emerging markets, slowing down very sharply to a sustainable rate, you know, 7% or so. Nonetheless, it seems to me to be pretty important in terms of the prospects for emerging markets. Your comments would be welcome. Lucio. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, first, a few considerations in terms of uh, figures. As we pointed out, uh, there is a significant component of uh, a structural slowdown in China, uh, but the largest part is still cyclical, right? And we should keep things in proportion. You are absolutely right on the sense that uh, China, by definition, could not be growing at 10% forever. I don't think that we were ever among those that uh, used this as a punchline. Uh, a China that is growing at 7% now happens to be a much larger China than that China that was growing at 10% six or seven years ago. So even with this uh, smaller headline uh, growth rate, we are actually talking about a final impact in terms of uh, global demand, which is not significantly different than what was the China of uh, five or seven years ago, growing at 10%, simply because the size of the Chinese economy is considerably larger than what uh, was when it was growing at 10%. Now, uh, in terms of the actual figures of the uh, uh, structural growth deceleration, if we uh, think of this in those terms, right? Uh, roughly 3% uh, growth has been lopped off from China in the past three years, so it uh, went down from 10 to 7. Of this fall, just about 1% actually is a structural growth slowdown. The other 2% are the cyclical component, right? Which are also related to the police measures that the Chinese government pump it up in the Chinese economy immediately after the, uh, the Great Recession. In a way, I take comfort from the fact that when you look at that, the uh, trend growth rate of China is still considerably respectable. And again, we are talking about an economy which is much larger than before. I don't have particular concerns in terms of the uh, external demand shock that China provides to other emerging markets, as long as we uh, buy the notion that the uh, long-term, medium-term growth rate of China is still around 7%. If you allow me a second point uh, on that, uh, this is another discussion that we have concerning the so-called uh, implications of the rebalancing of the Chinese economy. I think that this is uh, significantly misinterpreted uh, both by market operators and also by analysts. Um, first, because of the simple denominator effect that I told you before, right? Even if the Chinese economy is uh, demanding a smaller amount of uh, whatever is the input, uh, commodities or whatever, per unit of growth, just the share size of the beast implies that the final impact actually is uh, as, uh, as large as before when you look at it. The second point related to the uh, question of rebalancing on China is that in the end of the day, you are still demanding uh, products from those emerging markets. It's just that the bundle of commodities or products that China is demanding because it is rebalanced in a way while it's uh, becoming more mature is different, right? But you are still demanding uh, a significant amount of exports, whatever they might be, from emerging markets in general. It's just that the composition of those imports are different. So I also think that we should not overestimate the negative impacts uh, of the uh, Chinese growth normalization uh, uh, because of this factor too. So. Can I can I respond? Yes. Yeah. So so, so I, I think uh, the way to I think the way I think about China ten to seven percent, three effects. One commodity prices. 
but that's globally a wash. Some importers, some exporters. Two, uh, the growth deceleration has been accompanied by a significant uh, rebalancing. You know, the internal rebalancing hasn't happened, but the external has. So by definition, China is actually uh, sucking less demand out of the system. So in a cyclical global sense, that's actually a positive shock to the global economy. So one neutral, one positive. And the other, of course, is the pure you know, market effect, demand effect, which will be negative. Uh, so, so that's why I think even analytically, I think it's not completely negative. And then I would, uh, uh, the last point I would make, of course, is that, you know, um, foreign demand uh, for your exports affects short-run growth. Uh, foreign demand for your products is really, again, how much you export in the medium term of a country is really depends upon what it does internally rather than what it does externally. So, uh, so I'm not saying there'll be no negative effect, but I think you have to analyze it in terms of these four effects to actually see whether how negative or positive it's going to be. Uh, let me just to do a small uh, analytical uh, uh, add-on to what uh, Arvind just said. When you actually look at the figures, and we have simulations that we did uh, uh, internally on that, when you do Chinese growth slow down, combined with uh, rebalancing of the Chinese economy, right, and look at the effects of this in terms of uh, external trading partners of China, adding the rebalancing effect to the growth slow down actually takes away, uh, depending on the country, up to two-thirds of the negative effects that you would have from the growth slowdown. So the rebalancing effect actually cushions to a significant degree the negative effects that you can have out of the growth slowdown. So analytically, you do have this uh, on hard figures, right? Not only as a opinion, but when we look at the phenomena, you actually observe it too. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions, which is great. Could I ask the gentleman at the far back to go to the mic? And then um, you'll get in later, if, since you already went once. And uh, then Jacob, and then, then Bill. Yeah, uh, Paulo Vira da Cunha from Ice Canyon and the Monk School at Toronto. Um, yeah, two questions for Arvin. On, on the trade issue, uh, how much, we know that a lot of the trade now is intra-industry and in fact intra-firm. So to what extent um, is that a story on the protectionism and uh, you know that perhaps you don't see as much of the protectionism because the trade is taking place uh, within that context. And in that, in that uh, vein, the same thing about, which is a discussion I've had with Danny, uh, you know, this question of the capital flows, isn't it the fact that financial markets are more integrated than real economies? And to the extent that the financial markets are affected uh, by global financial conditions to a much immediate effect and to the capital flows to immediate effect, uh, are you trying to say that, that uh, financial deepening has no effect on growth? Uh, or are you, uh, are you negating that as well, or is it a question of which way you're looking at the transmission mechanism? And just as an aside, I agree that over the very long medium term, the commodity impacts of, uh, of China is awash, but the composition matters a great deal uh, over you know, perhaps three or four or five years. So you, you could have significant effects there. Yeah, please. Um, l l l l l let me answer the, at least the first two, and, and because the third we've dealt with. Uh, yes, I, I think it's absolutely true that uh, uh, you see much less protectionism now uh, because of the, the modern phrase for this is the global value chain. You know, so uh, yeah, it, it, and that's that certainly has contributed to um, um, that. But. but so, I, and I agree with that. That's, that's absolutely the case. You know, the, the share of, uh, if, if you look now at uh, how much, the, the difference between gross trade and value-added trade, that's kind of a measure of how much we're part of value-added chains, and that's actually uh, very high. But I think that coexists in parallel with, uh, you know, the other phenomenon, which is just a lot more FDI, a, 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 and what that has also done to, you know, muting protectionist concerns. I mean, I, I, I always say that, you know, the, the reason why we didn't see much more protectionist uh, 
action against Chinese currency policies in the US is because American firms are in there or, or need Chinese markets. So the whole, you know, so in some sense, integration sustains more integration or, or su integration uh, is a bulwark against you know, protectionist forces, and, and that's the kind of integration begets, begets integration dynamic that, that you quite rightly identify. Now, on, on capital flows, uh, I'm, th this is something that I feel strongly about. I, I, I think the evidence is very clear that, look, when you talk about, you have to distinguish between domestic financial development, financial deepening, right, from foreign financial integration. These are two completely different things. And uh, they say, and I'll take their word for it, although I, I don't actually uh, 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 believe it, is that you know, f even domestic financial deepening is, is good for growth. Uh, I think it's a correlation. I, I think the causation is far from, uh, I've yet to see a really, uh, you know, st a study with good <clears throat> identification, good econometrics, which actually shows that you know, uh, finan domestic financial deepening uh, promotes long run growth, but I'll take their word for it. But that's very different from financial capital market integration. Foreign flows are, you know, um, and the reason they have no impact is one, they lead to boom and bust cycles, and the second, they lead to appreciated exchange rates. And, and I keep saying, if, if you ask me what is the one genius, act of genius that the Chinese did in the last 20 years, um, and it's a non-action, it is not to open the capital account when they were growing at gangbusters, because everyone and his uncle would have said, oh, you're growing rapidly, this is the time to open the capital account, and they said, no, we're going to keep the mercantilist engine going for longer time by keeping the capital account closed. And that, you know, bad for the world, maybe, bad for the US, maybe, but from Chinese development strategy point of view, genius. But with just one point in terms of the uh a cat that uh, did not meow, or a dog that did not bark, the protectionist one. Uh, I'm a guy that has a strong belief in institutions in general, right? I think that one of the reasons which is frequently underappreciated is that we now have an institutional global framework for upholding free trade, which simply was not there back in the 1930s. In the end of the day, we have not only a WTO, but a WTO which was wise enough to bring all the big players into the table, and that does make a significant difference. So one of the reasons why this particular dog did not bark is because we have institutions now. Now, on the, the final point of the gentleman, of course there are going to be adjustment costs, right? This is not a neoclassical perfect model. There are adjustment costs to anything, right? Be those uh, changing of a growth model of a country, or a switching of the monetary policy of the uh, American Federal Reserve. There are always short-run adjustment costs. Those are inevitable, right? But we should also pay attention to what are the final results of those policy actions and uh, structural changes. Okay. We had a backup of questions. I've got Jacob. I've got, oh my god, I'm blanking on your name. Roz. Roz Engel, sorry. I've got Bill, and I've got our friend from Ziff, um, and I'm spacing out, and I apologize. Jacob. The quick question, I think probably mostly for Arvind. Can you boil down your, uh, you know, sort of rosy outlook for emerging markets and continuing convergence to really that stop doing dumb things is enough to escape the middle income trap? Uh, is that... Uh, because it seems to me that, uh, you know, that's essentially what you're saying. Because I think you could make a case that many of the drivers of the shock you made are really, you know, China stopped being Maoist. Uh, that helps quite a bit. India stops being a closed economy. People throw up the communist joke. You join the global economy. But those are largely one-off events. And there seems to be a somewhat normative assessment built in there to me somewhere that you're basically assuming that actually they will continue to run really sensible policies. Which reminds me of a study we did here at the uh, Peterson Institute some while ago, which showed or pretended to show that emerging markets' long-term fiscal futures were much rosier than advanced economies, but it was all basically premised on the fact that they would sort of keep their pre-industrial country levels of uh, social welfare, etc., which I think in a dynamic long-term political economy is highly unlikely. So that's the question. Um, before my colleagues respond, I, I'll just put in a word on this. 
I, I think the don't do anything stupid school of growth is actually a very powerful school. Um, it's when you when you look at who falls out, whether it's whether it's Zimbabwe, Albania, North Korea, or Venezuela, arguably right now, you know, the, doing something stupid. But even within the, is a big explanatory factor. Um, even within the developed economies, you know, my my one of my hobby horses is that Japan did some really stupid things in the 1990s, and that explained a lot of their problems. So I think the I'm not sure, Jacob, that we want to set it up as about the middle income trap. I think I would set it up in much the way that, that Arvind just did, which is you have a certain point of growth at which you should be on your fundamentals, and then convergence is part of that. But the shortfall from that is, 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 is stupidity is a highly consistent variable. And the other thing before my colleagues come in is just to say, Picking up on the spirit of what uh, Luthio just said, no, you're right. There is no uh, Whig interpretation of history, no second law of thermodynamics for good policies that you cannot reverse. But in places with rule of law that do achieve middle class status, there is a stickiness to some institutions that, that I think make reversal harder. And that gets into many of the political economy issues you work on. Good. Just very briefly, and I was going to say exactly that, right? Not doing stupid things is strongly underestimated as a police prescription and as an individual uh, life strategy, too, I might say. Right? <laughs> so uh, beyond that, and uh, allow me just to a uh, personal hobby horse of mine, and as someone that has part of his career in the bank, is that the notion that there is something called a middle income trap lacks amazingly analytical background when you start looking at this, right? It is exactly. a uh, very good marketing strategy from a common friend of ours, Indermit yeah, Gil, exactly. Gil, but yeah. analytically, when you look at it, it's simply really not there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a great resistance to this. Uh, as a, just a final quote, a part of what I was trying to say is that there is a fundamentals-based notion on the continued convergence of emerging markets, so the differential growth in relation to uh, advanced economies, which at the end of the day is still there, right? That's the notion that part of the component which is structural is smaller, right? So you still have this longer term uh, trend of convergence, which at the end of the day is still there. Yeah. Just to, uh, to three basic points on this. Um, I just uh, taught the middle income trap this morning in class, and, and, and I've surveyed the evidence, and, and Lucio's uh, exactly right on this. There's very little evidence uh, for properly defined middle income traps, uh, uh, one. Two, a, a lot of the countries that we're talking about, you know, even India and you know, South Asia, Africa, they're not even close to the middle income trap. So, you know, a, a big bulk of them are, 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 st are still not there. A and third, remember, finally, uh, 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 as I showed, even with all these projections, you are going to see some uh, narrowing of the convergence going forward, partly because countries like China are going to slow down. So I, I think all three are consistent w w with, with this phenomenon, yeah? Uh, to Roz, please, and then Bill, and then Chris. So I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually go revisit that question because I um, wasn't quite sure we got to the part of it that I really wanted to answer. Um, so one of the factors you sometimes hear when you're thinking or hearing about emerging market turbulence is political risk. Um, and uh, you sort of mentioned a little bit or seemed to suggest that you felt that the political outlook, I think is the way you put it, was um, pretty positive or more positive maybe than the press is suggesting. And I just wanted you maybe to explore that a little bit because, um, you know, as countries particularly go through, say, financial market turbulence, growth slowdowns, and then we have lots of elections, which is something that's also been kind of mentioned in this context, you sometimes see policy mistakes or wishful thinking or other sorts of uh, problems. So one, I was sort of curious if you could really clarify, do you really think that we're in a different kind of world where political leaders are actually going to make better policy decisions? And the second part of that is, I guess I'm kind of curious why um, you might think that we're in a slightly different place in terms of the quality of policy or institutional quality. 
So, uh, I mean, is everybody just smarter? You know, have we just all gone to the right grad schools and, you know, everybody's just a good technocrat and we kind of get it? Or is it that um, maybe institutions are sort of more constrained and disciplined by globalization and more open markets? So, you know, the consequences of failing or making a policy decision, bad one is, are higher. Um, or are we just in a situation where people have just been very cautious and risk averse and built up big cushions and so, you know, they kind of have big insurance policies behind them? Be, again, I'd love to have my colleagues answer, but I want to point out that part of, you forgot hypothesis number four, that the excellent work of the Peterson Institute and Moody's Investor Service has led people into better, better policies. But, but the increase of the cost of stupid mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Lucy, you want to take it? Uh, sure. no, no, uh, you know, sure, sure, uh, 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 I want to say three things, and uh, this is uh, maybe partly reflects uh, uh, my kind of Indian bias, uh, is that certainly the two big economies in the world, India and China, uh, I, I think uh, in India the political outlook is looking better because we've had basically bad governance uh, for, for a long time, corruption, etc. And in fact, if you look at all the polling in India, uh, the issue that voters say they care about most are gov uh, you know, governance, growth, inflation, and not identity and caste and all these things. Uh, one. And, and also in the last two, three election cycles in India, more state governments that have done well have been rewarded in the polls. So in a sense, <coughs> democracy itself is delivering the results. I, th I think in, in places like India, and I would say possibly also in, in Indonesia. The second thing is, is that in China, I think uh, you know, Nick and Adam know this better. I mean, one gets the sense that you know, the reform agenda is back. We don't know when the timing is going to be. But all the signals that we see in terms of what China is doing, both on the uh, financial side and on the trade side, uh, uh, make me optimistic that you know, reforms are, you know, are more likely than not likely to happen. And I think finally the, the, what we underestimate is the point that you made that when people start do, stop doing stupid things, they stop doing stupid things for two reasons. You know, one, because they come from a, a bad history. You know, they did really stupid things, they see the consequences, they don't want to repeat it. And then you see you know, what happens around the world. So the idea of sound macroeconomic policies is, I would argue, part of the TFP that we see in growth, uh, in, in growth regressions, that you know, TFP is about you know, not just technology, but about good ideas. Uh, and not doing stupid thing is part of the good idea that's traveled due to globalization. I cannot stop it as an ending, so please. <laughs> Very good. Um, Bill and then Chris. Lucy, I, I wonder whether your result, which is dominantly cyclical, is affected by your choice of the base year, 2010, and the terminal year, 2013. 2010 was a sharp recovery from a very low, very weak 2009. So I'm a little concerned that the structure of the test may almost by definition give you a very heavily cyclical uh, result. Now, the bottom line though is whether 2010 was too high or 2013 is too low in some sense. So the way I'm looking at this is that the fund has taken off a full percentage point on emerging market growth for its five year out, uh, cut it down from basically six and a quarter to five and a quarter as sort of the, what you'd say steady state emerging market growth. And if it, if it is gonna be five and a quarter, that would be the same average as in 1996 to 2005. So we had this aberrational period maybe when you had seven and a half percent growth from 2006 uh, to 2008, uh, and so my question basically is, at the end of the day, after you take all this into account, does your cyclical dominance result mean that don't worry, we're going back to six and a quarter, because that's the, that's the uh, structural, or yeah, we are going to go at a five and a quarter, and maybe even less than that. I mean, how, how do you come out looking forward against the fund? And, of course, in a sense, that was implicit in Jose's discussion of the average growth rates as well in Latin America. Uh, 
Yep, uh, I will have to uh, reply by the negative uh, on the sense that uh, you are implying the structural big question in relation to the sample that we chose. We effectively chose the top of the cycle uh, uh, to, uh, to the bottom. I could not reply with uh, any uh, uh, analytical certainty if we had chosen a different time sample that the results would be uh, different. But uh, that is a very interesting uh, question, and I assure you personally that once I'm back to New York, I will put my team working on it. Thanks, Lucio and Arvin, for, for speaking today. Um, I guess I, I had a question that kind of maybe a bit first to Arvin um, on his, uh, his view on the outlook for global integration, but then trying to link it to the work that Lucio's team has done. So the first is, um, you know, one of the big stories in the 2000s, so it's from 90s to 2000s, was the integration of China, but the, also the TFP shock of production chains, right? I mean, it was a big technology improvement, in being able to disintermediate production. Uh, if you continue to think that we're going to have globalization, are you seeing a similar sort of technology shock? And if so, what, what do you think it might be? If you maybe could sort of think, sort of project forward um, in that regard, because it, you know, all the stories you're hearing is production moving from China to Bangladesh, right? Which is not really disintermediation, right? It's just spreading it out a little bit, but it's not really continuing globalization. Um, and that's to link back to with Lucio, because if you, Lucio's work, because if, this is the second question is, if you think that there is um, a structural slowdown in China that's larger might, than the rest of the EM, might that not have a feedback loop, right, if you're thinking that there's going to be, you know, China is the next wave of potential growth, a uh, growth engine, right? And if it's structurally slowing, is that really likely that the EMs are also going to, you know, be, be able to bend up, ride that globalization wave of China really continuing to enter onto the stage? Just taking first the first part of your question. Uh, effectively, the usage of a production function approach enables you to decompose what are the contributions of the different factors to growth and also to the cyclical and structural components. Another way of saying that is that uh, I can look at the results for the aggregate for the individual countries and see how much of this is coming out of TFP and how much of this is related to cyclical deceleration or the structural deceleration. Good news there on the sense that uh, TFP, and especially for countries like China, has been holding quite well. A significant part of the deceleration that you have in the country is relation to things which are intuitive in a way. The country has not only an Asian workforce, but actually has a contracting workforce. So a great component of the cyclical uh, deceleration in China is coming out, not of the technology uh, shock itself, but just out of people, right? Because surprisingly, they actually have less people and people which are older, right? So from the point of view of the medium-term drivers, the fact that TFP has been holding well uh, throughout the past five years actually is one of the uh, positive uh, sides of the story here. There are some countries in which the TFP shock is actually negative. There are countries, for instance, in which all the three factors are combined, uh, generating negative contributions to growth. Russia, incidentally, is one of those uh, countries in which TFP shock is negative, capital accumulation shock is negative, and the uh, populational shock is negative. In the case of China, because of the underlying positive dynamics of TFP, that's one of the things that I find positive out of the uh, Chinese growth story, too. On the second part of your question, which is effectively how uh, emerging markets are going to react one way or another to this ongoing uh, slowdown, uh, I think that we have to have as a default that economies adjust, right? That there are costs on the adjustment process that is not instantaneous, but that in the end of the day, if you are faced as a country with a different set of uh, external shocks, your productive structure will adapt to it. Practical example, a country that is usually associated to uh, significant uh, sensitivity to a China shock, a country like Brazil, right? Uh, if you look at what they did in terms of the uh, structural composition of the Brazilian economy, to be 
able to cater to the particular demands of the uh, People's Republic of China throughout the late 80s and the 90s, they actually expanded and created whole new sectors of the Brazilian economy to respond to this external shock. One has to presume that the adjustment is going to be symmetric. If they are faced with a different type of external shock, the country will naturally adjust. Not necessarily instantaneously, certainly not costlessly, but they will adjust. I just want to say that uh, I didn't quite understand. The first point is that, you know, when you, when you said, you know, the kind of fragmentation is not real trade, it's just kind of whatever, you know, the same thing being, uh, just a technical point is that, you know, the, the, the chart that I showed you on hyper-globalization, that actually the pattern is exactly the same when you measure trade in value-added terms. So the whole, you know, even taking account of value-added chains, that, that, that continues. This has been a terrific discussion. No, I, we're at our coffee break. Uh, I'm going to give you 15 minutes to play outside in our sculpture garden. And at three, a little less than 15 minutes, and at 3 o'clock, we will have the final panel of today's session. Thank you very much. Arvind, Lucio. <laughs>